everyone once again to the Investing in Real Estate podcast. I am Clayton Morris, and I am joined this week by my wife. Say hello. Hello. That's Natalie Morris. You know her over from nataliemorris.com. And of course, we like to have her join us here once a week, on, or I'm sorry, once a month here on the podcast to dive into sort of like the family structure of how we do things with taxes and how we really maximize our real estate investing. But we are joined by a really special guest today. I'm saying really special because the book that I think changed our lives and the way in which we structure our family business, we can all point to one man, Mike Michalowicz, his book, Profit First, which is the subtitle is A Simple System to Transform Any Business from a Cash-Eating Monster to a Money-Making Machine. We have structured our entire family business spreadsheets, everything around the, po- uh, the around the Profit First system. And I am thrilled to have Mike on the show today with us. Mike, are you ready? I am ready, and thank you for having me, and, and thanks for Wow, engaging Profit First to its fullest. That's that's pretty freaking cool. <laughs> well, we hope that we haven't engaged it to its fullest. I blame Natalie because she's really the sort of the brains behind implementing the system. You know, I read the book, I think maybe a year, a year and a half ago to two years ago, and I said, Natalie, read this and implement it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, good job, Natalie. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm not sure I'm doing it 100% correctly um, even though I diligently took notes and downloaded your you know your sheets and I you know go exactly by your distribution according to how much we make per year but I still have so many questions so that's why I was so excited that we actually have you in the flesh well on Skype we're, we're yeah not, right right we're, we don't have him tied up anyway <laughs> forcing him to answer a question I want to kind of break it you know down because we have a limited amount of time obviously with Mike so I want to kind of at least set a little frame of reference for people. Mike, can you give us a little overview of the Profit First system? Obviously, you've got a lot of great books, and we could do a whole other episodes on the Pumpkin Plan, which I love as well. But today, I really want to focus on real estate investing and how someone who maybe owns one property, wants to get to 10 properties, 15 properties, can really implement the Profit First system in their lives to maximize the profits and tax benefits of it. Can you give us an overview of the Profit First system? Absolutely. So Profit First is, I guess, summarized into a behavioral-based cash management system. And maybe that sounds a little bit heady, but I'll I'll give a story behind it of of how this works and what it is. I I was blown away by a statistic I heard, and I think it was the SBA who reported it. I don't know the actual original source, but it said that 83% of businesses, small businesses that do under $25 million in revenue, that's how it's defined, 83% are not profitable. 83% are living check by check. And that's true in real estate to, you know, rolling cigars. I mean, any kind of business, if it's a small business, most businesses aren't surviving. But what struck me was how can so many people be smart enough and capable enough to get into their industry, attract clients and prospects, do their services, make real money doing it, have clients raving or happy about the experience. Like there's thousands of elements to running a business successfully. And we literally get all right, except one little piece. Most businesses can't figure out profit. So at first I thought it was us. Like, is there something wrong with us? Like, has our brain brain been lobotomized out of profit? And then uh, I came to realize it's a behavioral response to the system we've been told to use, which is totally flawed. We're told that sales minus expenses equals profit. And while logically it makes sense, you have to sell stuff, you have to pay for stuff, and what's left over, you keep profit. Logically, it makes sense. Behaviorally, it's totally flawed because it's human nature when something's put last that we disregard its significance. We basically ignore it. Like, you wouldn't get sick, Clayton, and all of a sudden say, I'm going to start putting my health last. No, you take on my health first. Right. What's important gets prioritized. And so the old formula, sales minus expenses, we're saying sales and expenses are first. And so we try to sell hard and we try to grow, that's the word we use for expenses, constantly, and profit never happens. The the summary is, in profit first, I say take your profit first. Sales minus profit, take that profit first at every transaction equals expenses. And by taking your profit first, you're now prioritizing what's important. So what I write about a lot on my blog is how to make your family finances into some kind of formal business, whether it's some kind of real estate investment business, or maybe you sell graphic design on Etsy, or maybe you're a dog walker, whatever it is, you know, the tax code really favors people who are entrepreneurial. So Mm -hmm. I talk a lot about how people can somehow turn their family into some kind of 
you know, legitimate business. And for us, that's mm. real estate investing. And so, you know, one of the big paradigm shifts I had to make was to think of us as a startup because that's what we are, is that we are a startup as real estate investors. And so we started small and we're gaining our portfolio, building it out as much as we can, as fast as we can. And that's why your book was so game changing for us. Because if I think of us as a startup, then I can think about how I pay us and how I save to invest in the business and how I save for taxes and how I save for, you know, owner pay and, um, you know, this, this quarterly bonus that we take based on your system really helps us a lot. It's like, like last quarter we, we used it to take our kids to Disney world because oh, that's awesome. that's it so- has to be something fun. You can't like pay a credit card with right. it. And we take it seriously. So maybe you can, you know, if we all can wrap our heads around our families as a startup, then we can implement this system. So maybe we can sort of break it down little by little. And you can take us through the four places that you funnel your money when you make money. Yep. So the practical application of it. So the concept is take your profit first. And what that means is when money comes into your business through sales or however you generate money, um, that it then gets pre-allocated to specific purposes. The, let me kind of talk about the problem first. The, the traditional business setup or family business setup is that money comes in and we see that one checking account and we say, oh, I have X number of dollars available to do what I need to do next. And it often becomes an expense. Uh, and we use soft terms for expenses inevitably. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm plowing it back. I'm reinvesting. I'm growing. I'm facilitating growth. But in the profit first method, what we do is we allocate money first to its different purposes. It's kind of like my mother did the envelope system when I was growing up. Like she would get money in, she'd put some money into the food envelope, some money into the give back to community envelope and so forth. And when she went food shopping, when she got to the food market, she always had enough money. Now, the interesting thing, it wasn't always the same amount of money, but she always had enough because she would make do with what was in there. And that's what the profit first concept is based on. When say a thousand dollars comes in for round number's sake, we predetermine a profit percentage, let's say 10%. So $1,000 comes in, $100, 10%, will go into an account, an actual standalone checking or savings account at your bank, and we allocate the $100 there. We also have tax responsibilities, so we have to allocate money to taxes, maybe, just picking a random number, 15%. So 150 goes there. Then there's an um, owner's pay. As operators of this business, running the business, you need to be paid for what you do. Don't confuse, by the way, profit and owner's pay. Owner's pay is designed to support your lifestyle. That is the money you're being paid to run your business, and you're being paid, uh, and that money you take out of it is to support your current lifestyle. The profit account, those distributions, are above and beyond your lifestyle. That's why I argue it's got to be a reward. However you want it to be a reward. Disney, pretty freaking awesome. Um, And you can use it in any purpose, but not to support your existing lifestyle. For most business owners, we kind of glum all that money together, glop it together, and then when it comes out, we can't distinguish, is this to support my lifestyle? Is this something above and beyond? So we usually ramp our lifestyles up to the very last penny we have coming in, and we live check by check now in our life. So our business is now going to allocate money to owner's pay, that's one of the accounts, and to profit and tax. And then the last account is operating expenses. And what's so interesting about this, when you run the percentages, Maybe the operating expenses account is 50%. Depending on your business, it can vary. Maybe it's 75%. Some businesses run it very tightly. Maybe it's 30% or 20%. But let's just say it's 50%. What that means is when $1,000 comes in, we used to say, ah, I have $1,000 to run my business. Now, the profit first system says, no, no, you don't have $1,000 to run your business. You have $500, that 50% in operating expenses, to run your business. The rest has been reserved already for your benefit and other purposes, but not to run your business on. Okay. And so, you know, some of the comments that I've had on my blog when I've preached this system religiously is, oh my gosh, you have to have four different accounts and that sounds like a pain in the butt. And maybe it is kind of a pain in the butt. And, you know, especially as real estate investors, we just had a meeting with our tax accountant and they're like, well, we want different LLCs for different assets. And I'm like, but that's that's different LLCs with four different bank accounts. And oh my gosh, my head is spinning. But I really think that you have to separate it like your mom's envelopes, because if you don't, it's too tempting to spend the government's money, right? You must separate it. And 
the, you know, I've presented literally two days ago, 1,000 or three days ago now, 1,000 people in the Bahamas, and I'm talking to them about Profit First. And the first hand comes up and says, gosh, it's so many accounts. I can't do it. And I'm like, part of me wants to say, stop your whining. I mean, literally, right. is it that hard to set up a bank account? <laughs> is it really? I, but I, I don't think, I think we're very drawn to the familiar. We've been running our business one way with one checking account, doing all these different things, and it's not been working. And it's very compelling, ironically, to keep doing what's familiar, even though it's not working, than trying something new. And when we just use this, the hard work of setting up four accounts or five accounts or whatever you do for your business, we, we use that as an argument to go back to what's already familiar and not working. So, yeah, it's going to take an hour to go to the bank and set these accounts. But when it's done, you have absolute clarity. Now, other people have come to me, Natalie and Clayton, and said, oh, why don't you do this in a spreadsheet? Or, or better yet, why don't you do it in my accounting system? I can keep one bank account, but I'll just do this in my accounting system or in a spreadsheet. Well, here's the reality. Every accounting system already allocates money. It's called the chart of accounts. There's money allocated to tons of things. You know, How's that working for you now? For most people, it doesn't work. And the reason Profit First does work is because it's a behavioral system. It's in what's called our immediate behavioral path. When I manage my, my money, I honestly do not look at my profit P&L. I do not look at my balance sheet and my cash flow statement. Quite frankly, I don't even know how to read those properly. And then, as my accountant says, tie them all together and run KPIs against it, uh, key performance indicators, and operating cash flow metrics, and then I'll know where my money is. That stuff is so far over my head, I revert to my natural behavioral path, which is log into my bank account and see what's available and make a gut decision. Profit First is set up that works within your natural default behavior. It's at your bank account. You cannot avoid it. It brings absolute clarity every time you log into your bank account. That's why these accounts are so important. I love it. And, you know, the structure of the business for me, it's, it's so much clarity to know what you're working with, right? You, you, you mentioned this operating expenses account. It's like, okay, so if we want to spend $1,000 a month on marketing or, you know, whatever your business happens to be, and you're going to spend, you know, you can look, you can log right in, whether maybe it's Facebook advertising, or maybe it's some other, you know, some other thing you're spending money on. You can log right in and see how much money you have to work with, and you're not having to back that out. It's right there. And you've already taken all of those other, you know, all of the, your profit out, everything is set aside, the taxes are set aside. And so you're not scrambling every quarter to pay taxes or at the end of the year, oh my God, we didn't even save for taxes because we've been spending everything on expenses. Right, right. So there's uh, there's a lot of little behavioral things that go on. In regards to taxes, there is a behavioral response called loss aversion. And loss aversion me st- states that it's human, propen- it's human nature that when we are in a position of losing something that we already possess, we will go to an extreme, often irrational measure to retain it. Yet we won't go to that same extreme to gain something equivalent. Here's an example. We'll talk about houses in the real estate market. If, if you or I get a call from a mortgage company saying, we're going to repossess your house or you know, we're going to call in your mortgage because you haven't made a payment, uh, you're going to lose your house, I will go to an extraordinary measure not to lose my home. I will you know, start working for Uber. I'll do whatever it takes, whatever hour it is, hours it requires to retain my house. Now, the irony is I could always have done that level of work to gain the bigger house down the street, but I don't do it. It's human propensity that we are will make basically double the effort to keep what we already possess. So how this translates to taxes is when, if you get taxes paid to you through a distribution or paycheck or however you take money out of your business, and then taxes are due, we experience loss aversion because we had the money. It's like me giving you $10 and saying, oh, hey, Clayton, give me back three of those bucks. It's like, thanks for 10, but what are you, what are you doing with these three bucks? That's weird. And we'll go to an extreme measure. Conversely, if I just gave you seven bucks and said, hey, thanks, thanks for having me on your show. Here's seven bucks to get yourself a cup of coffee. It's like, oh, that's still kind of weird, but you don't feel loss aversion of me taking the money back. When we experience loss aversion, especially around, ta- around taxes, we go to extreme measures often spending erratically and uh, irrationally to reduce the tax consequence, literally spending $10 to save three, which makes no sense whatsoever. (laughs) That's amazing. You know, one of the lessons I learned from another book that I think put in conjunction with your book is really game-changing was Tax-Free Wealth by Tom Wheelwright. And Mm. he really makes the point that 
you know, investment, capital investment in a business, whether it's buying real estate or any other real estate or any other business expense is a taxable deduction. So if you can maximize your deductions, you lower your tax rate. And you say in your book, you know, really like 15% should be enough to put aside for taxes. And before we just were like, well, we hope that we'll have that money. You know, we'll just try not to spend it. But now we literally put it in a different bank with a transfer. So yes. I can't even really get to it because it was just too tempting to spend it. And she won't and- even let me see it, Mike. I mean, like, oh, I don't even, <laughs> she's like, cause she knows like, I'll just buy a house with that cash. And I like, I literally don't even have access. She was smart. She hasn't even given me, you know, she's like, I don't know. You can't look at it. Just this ta- our tax account. Don't touch it. And the game changing thing for us as real estate investors, Mike, was that at the end of the year, we actually got money back on our taxes because, you know, we buy real estate. So right. the tax benefits of real estate are you know, astronomical. And I said to her, I said, wait a second, have we been putting 15% away? And she said, yeah. So we have about 60, we had like 60,000 in an account for taxes, but we got money back for taxes. So that money oh, is like extra really- money that we could then, you know, y- y- buy real estate with, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Then you can use it the way you see fit. So, so if- but it's money he was- hadn't psychologically possessed. You know, that was the the game changer because he couldn't see it. He didn't know it existed. It took the discipline of getting it out of his sight. That is the whole goal. So I, I am bowing to both of you right now. Uh, I wish you could see me because you were <laughs> excellent just perfectly. The, 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 the draw of temptation uh, is very powerful. And when it's close and accessible, we have to use willpower and willpower fatigues like a muscle. I can, you know, me as chocolate chip cookies, if, if there was a baked chocolate chip cookie batch in front of me, I would say no the first time. The second time, I'd be like, yeah. The third time, I start sniffing it. And the fourth time, I would be diving in with that stuff. So my wife and family knows, you know, keep the chocolate chip cookies out of daddy's way because he's an animal. Right. And because no <laughs> chocolate chip cookies in his house, I don't eat them. I do not eat them. So that's the lesson. Money, even if we pre-reserve money for clear purposes like profit or our tax liabilities or anything like that, there will come the moment where our mind says, well, it's just sitting there. We don't need to use that for three, four months anyway. The tax bill isn't coming for a while. Why don't you just kind of borrow from that account? And that's where we actually are stealing from ourselves uh, and, and damaging ourselves and, and then undermining the entire system. So keep it out of sight. Now, I want to ask a question about paying yourself, though, because the owner pay is yeah. up to 50%, right, in, in the way that you allocate your money. Owners get at least 50%. Well, um, let me just couch that. Depends, okay. First of all, it depends on the size of your business. A business doing under 500000 or under 250000 that applies. A bigger business, it changes. The, the second thing I want to share is that those are numbers based upon the these fiscally elite, I surveyed a thousand companies. That is the typical setup for a broad range of companies. So the, the final answer is 50% is just a suggested target, but it may not be perfect. You actually may be higher, you may be less, but it's just a rough target. Okay. Because I, you know, the first time I did this, I realized if I take 50% and I issue it to us as individuals, then we have to report it on our social security number as personal earnings. And I want to minimize the amount that I take out of my business because the business is a tax-friendlier vehicle than just paying it as Natalie Morris, the lady, and Clayton Morris, the man. Mm -hmm. So- I, you know, I always look at that 50% and I say, well, I don't want to be taxed on that 50%. So is that personal right. income? Is that taxed? You know, do you have any tips on that? Because I'm Great not question. sure I'm doing it right. Oh. And my accountant this year, I was like, well, I'll just 1099 myself from the business. He's like, you can't 1099 yourself. Um, so I did that wrong. So what tips do you have for me? Uh, Great. Great question. As a so- dummy. Um, I'm actually rewriting Profit First um, for an expanded uh, and kind of a new and improved edition as questions like this have come in. The answer is that Profit, or I call it Owner's Pay Account, not Profit, Owner's Pay Account, I really should have called it Owner's Compensation because it can you can re- extract benefit in multiple ways. Like you may lease a car or own a car, but the company can pay for it. But quite frankly, you derive the vast majority of benefits, your personal vehicle and maybe some business use, but the business can pay for it. And that's a legitimate tax expense. So I've changed owner's pay to owner's compensation. And then I suggest work very closely with your accountant to find ways to reduce the tax consequences and extract the most benefit from it. 
but still allocate 50% to owner's comp because I want you, Natalie, and you, Clayton, benefiting from that 50%. The way it's extracted out may not be a paycheck because it it causes higher taxes. It may be a car or a a, a quasi-investment or maybe a legit, whatever, but an accountant will direct you on it. The lesson is always allocate that percentage, and then when it's the actual extraction of that money, get the direction of a, a sophisticated accountant on that. Oh, okay. I see what I did wrong there because I wasn't sure that you couldn't 1099 yourself. And then, you know, my accountant is like, what did you do? And I was, he's like, we have to have a talk about this. So, you know, the, the point is to benefit from it legitimately, but it doesn't have to be on your personal social security. Right, it doesn't income. have to be pay. And, okay. And shame on me because in the book, I didn't explain that. I just said, this is for your benefit as your pay. But really, I want people to understand that you don't have to take money out as money you can take it out in different vehicles, and I I'm, I'm, don't mean necessarily a car, but different ways that reduce your tax consequence or negate it fully, but you still extract all the benefit from it. Because my parents owned a small business as I was growing up, and they always paid my father a very s- small salary um, mm-hmm. because they wanted to reinvest in the business. And it didn't make sense to me until I read your book and Tom Wheelwright's book. And now that makes sense why we, you know, owned cars inside of the business, but my dad still took a small salary. So, you know, I'm doing the same thing for us trying to live as, you know, as leanly as possible out of the profit, uh, out of the owner pay portion of our profit. And, and, and the only tweak I'll make to that is I suggest don't reinvest in the business as much as reinvest in you. Now, I got to be very careful how I explain this because it sounds like a very negative thing, and I'm not. When we allocate money to owner's comp, I want you and Clayton to benefit from that money, and I want you to do it through your business to reduce your tax consequences, but I don't want it going necessarily back into the business to facilitate growth of the business. And the reason I'm saying that is because most of the time, reinvested money never facilitates the growth of the business. It actually compromises it. And, and I'll give you an example of this. There, uh, NASA uh, made back, uh, this is in the 70s, um, a oxygen filter tank. Uh, and you're probably already familiar with this because if you saw the movie Apollo 13, uh, a big core of this movie revolved around that component. There was astronauts, this is a true story, astronauts up uh, in outer space circling the moon and their oxygen filter system was failing uh, and they were given about 12 more hours of oxygen before they were all going to die. Uh, and it's a true story again. The tanks and that oxygen filter system, NASA spent tens of millions of dollars to make those things. And then I don't know, if, did either of you see that movie by oh, any yeah, chance? yeah, sure. Okay. So then you'll know the next scene that happens. Oxygen tanks are failing. The lead engineer in Houston calls in all the engineers, a team of like five or six men and women, takes a box, a, a cardboard box with stuff and dumps on a table and says, that's what we have left on that shuttle up there, uh, on that capsule, make an oxygen filter. And they did. They did. They made an oxygen filter out of duct tape and used parts. Now, here's the irony. When NASA was given tens of millions of dollars to reinvest, to plow back, to push into this this program to develop an oxygen filter, they did, and it cost tens of millions. And when they were given just spare parts and were told, you have to make an oxygen filter, they did. And so the lesson is this. <laughs> if, if we avail the money to our business, our business will find the way to utilize that money, but not necessarily be innovative about it. That's the great irony. When we have to do the same, get the same results with less money or greater results with less money, it forces us to find new ways, rule-breaking ways, innovative ways. So that's why I'm hesitant when, when people say, oh, I'm going to reserve more money and plow back in my business or reinvest in my business. Be really careful of that. You actually may be following the easy, obvious path because now you have the means. When you don't give yourself the means, you have to find an innovative breakthrough way of doing the same thing. So it Makes might be, <clears throat> it might be instead of us, you know, investing it back in Morris Invest, our, our investment company, instead, Natalie and I just buying another property, which benefits us, but it also helps mitigate our overall taxes. Right. That, that could be a strategy. Hmm. That totally could be a strategy. Love it. Um, so I wanted to ask you uh, from a real estate perspective, um, if our, you know, as our listeners are setting up their, their family structure, uh, given your experience with real estate, uh, buying properties, rental income, are there any unique things that we would need to do to implement the profit first system? Yeah, so I, I'd say it's over my head because I don't do real estate. Um, I'm not an investor in real estate. 
And I've, I specifically have avoided it because I'm not versed in it. And I found that for me, and I believe this is true for most people, is when you find what your strength and capability is, go all in on that. I think strengths can be amplified by tenfold. But trying to walk in an area that I'm not familiar, I may stumble and trip up. So I'm not the guy. Now, now let me just also couch that one. I, and I'm not trying to pitch myself here or anything, but I started an organization specifically because I had questions like this. I got a call from a manufacturer saying, hey, how do you uh, employ lean manufacturing processes when it comes to profit first? And real estate investors like yourself and every category in the, the sun, real retail stores, everything. So I started an organization called Profit First Professionals where we now have industry-specific experts who can address all the nuances far times, uh, a thousand times better than I can. So I'd, I'd have to, I hate to say this, but I'd have to defer that. I don't know. No, I've actually, I actually have a, a, a buddy of mine who actually hired uh, and worked with your company and it's been a game changer for his business. So oh. uh, I, that's a testimonial, an unsolicited testimonial right there for that. So I was just curious, you know, if there was any sort of structuring of like when we, obviously we get rental income that comes in, we're treating it as, you know, if there was any specific difference from the profit first system, but it sounds like Natalie, we're doing it really according to the book, right? Mostly, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you are. I mean, here I'll give you some more generalities, um, but but something specific for real estate. So when income comes in, we want to put it typically all in one tray. I call it the income account. So this is now actually a fifth account. So we talked about profit, owners' pay, tax, and operating expenses. Fifth account is income, and this may help a lot. And if you're not doing it yet, this is something I'm actually had in the advanced section of Profit First, the book, but now I'm putting it right in the beginning because I found it had the greatest impact, is if we set one account solely to collect that rental income and whatever other income you generate into this income account, that's the serving tray. And you start understanding the cash flow, the inbound cash flow, because that money accumulates. And then periodically, maybe twice a month on the 10th and 25th, for example, you would allocate that money out based upon the percentages to different accounts. So that income account goes from wherever it was back to zero and then cash starts accumulating in there again, and it goes back to zero, and then accumulating again, and it keeps going through this iterative process, and you start seeing what your normal inbound cash flow is. But the other thing, too, to consider is the four or five accounts, that's just the basic foundation. My businesses, I, I now own three businesses, they have, on, on average, eight or nine accounts. Um, and the reason we have so many accounts is sometimes they're for businesses, there's very specific needs. If you need to accumulate cash specifically to buy new real estate, new properties, maybe you want to have a real estate purchasing account and you allocate a percentage there and that becomes the trigger. So you have your normal operating expenses for the ongoing maintenance and services you need to provide for your existing real estate. But then you set up this additional account that's specific to buying new property. And now it's very easy to distinguish where you stand on each account. Oh, I love that. I love that. We don't have that set up yet. That could be a game changer for us. No, we don't. Yeah. And at the end of your book, you talk about how you can, it's sort of like extra credit accounts. And that kind yes. of blew my mind open a little bit. And I was like, whoa, too much. Um, but I think at this point, now we have to go back. And now that I, because I just wanted to try like profit first for dummies, you know, like the first four accounts. And now that I think we've, I, I think we've been at this about a year. Um, after I, I think I got a good handle on it, I can go back through and do the extra credit accounts. So I'm ready for that. But I did have one reader question based on my yeah. blog post that said, you know, we're a new startup and we're trying to pay off debt. And this was a, a startup that I think they make like cookies or something like some food product. Mm. So they had to make a capital investment in the equipment. And so they were like, where do we allocate our money? We can't take 50% off. What do you say to people who have debt to pay off in their business first? Yeah, so and now I'm going to sound like a total schmo at first, but whenever someone says had to, like I had to buy equipment, I'm like, did you really have to? Or did you not consider the alternatives because you had the availability of money, right? So they got that money somehow, and then they followed an obvious path. Um, so I, I'm being a little schmucky here, but I always like to criticize that because... Right, and I don't know, you know, how yeah. to make these specific types of like, I don't know if they're cake Nor pops do I, I, but I always like to challenge people and say there's, there's an alternative path if we're simply willing to consider it or force ourselves to consider it. But if you have debt, first of all, welcome to 83% of small businesses. Like that's the norm. I'm not saying that's a good thing, but that's the norm. And listen, I've been there. It sucks. Here's what you do. You still set up a profit account. Some people have come to me and said, Mike, I, 
I can't be profitable until I'm out of debt. Then I'll be profitable. And my answer is the only way to get out of debt is by being profitable. You have to be. You have to make more money than you're spending in order to pay back what you owe. So you have to be profitable. So you set up the accounts the same way. You allocate money toward profit the same way. But when you do your profit distribution, and, and I suggest doing a quarterly profit distribution, literally every 90 days, when that money or the portion of the profit that you decide to take out comes out, the vast majority of it, 95% or more, goes toward debt eradication. You whack that debt, but you must still reward yourself with a portion. So say $1,000 comes out of your profit account. If we're doing 95%, $950, a big payment goes and hits that debt. As much as you can in the meantime, you're maintaining and paying the debt as best you can. But every time you do a profit distribution, a big portion goes to crushing that debt. But you still keep 5%, say 50 bucks, to celebrate. And this is the mistake. I've seen too many businesses, and some even some experts report this too, do everything you can to crush debt, eradicate debt, eradicate debt, at all costs, eradicate debt. The problem is, if you're simply in eradicating debt mode, you never have a celebratory mode, you never have that celebration, you start to resent your business. Can you imagine five years, four years, three, your business doesn't pay you, you keep deferring it. So listen, we got to get rid of that debt, but we still have to reward ourselves. That positive and very material affirmation that this is working is extremely important to keep the momentum going. So that's how I'd handle it with them. Oh, I love it. I love it. So um, I, I think we we're we probably uh, ate up so much of your time, but I think this was fantastic. Is there any ground, Natalie, you don't think we covered that I want our audience to really like go out there and start implementing this right away um, as they're acquiring their first rental property and getting things set up the right way? Is there anything we didn't cover that we need to? Well, I, I also want to be able to give you the chance to plug the fact that you have uh, like a network of accountants who can implement this for you, right? If you don't feel up to doing it yourself, um, you, you can go to Mike's website and he can point you in the right direction of someone in your area who understands this system and can implement it for you. Yeah, thank you. I, uh, and I did kind of mention a little earlier, really not attempting to plug it, but it's, it's a resource that's available for you. So here's what I found. The core concept of Profit First is very simple pay yourself first in your business. That's it. But it's kind of like the stock market. Everyone knows the core principle of the stock market. Buy low, sell high, do that again and again. You'll be a billionaire. Like, you know, that's it. But there's a reason there's stockbrokers and investment bankers and all these different people because of how sophisticated the market is after that basic principle. So in Profit First, it's the same way. What you just we just discussed is the basic principles of profit first, but it's in the nuances where the real execution happens. So I did start a group with a colleague. His name is Ron. Ron and I started this company. We now have 128 different accountants and bookkeepers specializing in different industries that know all the nuances about profit first. So they'll help you get it implemented. And then secondly, they'll actually go through all the different elements of it to make sure you continue on the path reducing your tax consequences, maximizing your profit, and taking home as much as you deserve to take home. And the site that we set up that, that has this is called ProfitFirstProfessionals.com. If you go there and click on the Find button, we'll find you someone that's a match for you. Amazing. The book is Profit First, a simple system to transform any business from a cash-eating monster to a money-making machine. Our guest has been Mike Michalowicz. It's been a true pleasure. We get to thank you personally for sort of shifting and changing our lives with our structure and our family business. Mike, you are the man. And we hope everyone will go over to our show notes page. Go to morrisinvest.com slash podcast. We're going to have links to everything we just talked about, including going over to uh, Mike's company to find an accountant in your area. Click on the Find tab and find somebody who can work with you. Also, links to the book and spreadsheets that Natalie was talking about so you can implement this in your own family. Uh, We'll see you back here next time on another episode of Investing in Real Estate. Thanks, everyone. 